recently, about two weeks ago, I went on a work trip to New York because the company I work for has their sales office in New York City. And uh, they invited me and a, a few other people from New Zealand over to have some discussions about the future of the company. This company, Dutch, I work for makes AI software to help workers in industrial jobs think manufacturing, energy utilities, mining, that kind, those kind of companies, access their information. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Something new comes up, the machine breaks. It's probably happened before somewhere else in the world. Let's access that information better and make it available to the worker who's in front of the machine wanting to fix it. So um, I'm not going to talk about that today. <laughs> That's for another setting. I'm going to talk about my realizations from going to New York City. This was the first time I, I have been to New York. Even though I'm technically an American citizen, I've never lived in America. <laughs> so make up that as you, what, as you will. Okay, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the city. It's impressive. It's full of food. Great for business. Full of robots. Expensive and has this thing called the High Line, all about me, and ultimately it's all an illusion. Okay, if that sounds interesting, let's get started. Yes. Okay, impressive city. New York City. 20 million people in a city about the same footprint as Auckland. Auckland, of course, has one million people. So, and more people in New York, four times more people in New York than all of New Zealand together. Huge city. Biggest city in America. Um, and it has this grid layout, which uh, when you look at it, you go, oh, that's been planned. That's not by accident. Someone has consciously made an effort to go, we're going to divide the city in these grids. We're going to name the streets one, two, three, four, five in each grid. <laughs> and it's, it speaks of design, right? It's not organically evolved. It's not it's haphazard. It speaks of someone actively caring about the city design and putting effort into it. And you think, oh, well, that, well, that's, that's kind of modern city design thinking. That kind of thing couldn't have happened in ancient times when people are, were primitive and in ancient times um, they didn't do anything like design complex cities. They just came, a bunch of people came together in a spot and the city resulted, right? Because uh, 2,000 years ago, you would never have a grid in a city, right? <laughs> So, uh, Roman city in North Africa, perfect grid design. And you think, well, okay, so the Roman, Roman civilization, yeah, they were an advanced civilization. But like before that, everything was primitive, right? <laughs> city in the Indus Valley civilization, India, Pakistan, 5,000 years ago, somewhat of a grid design. So yes, city planning has been around for a long time. Oh, is the little, let's. Move me slightly over, and then the lid of my laptop doesn't intrude on the projector. Okay. All right. So, uh, yes, city design has been around for many <laughs> thousands of years. And, but New York is an impressive city nonetheless. Lots of variety. You have old churches, glass towers, the stainless steel of the subway. <laughs> Everything seems to be made, of, be made of steel in the New York subway. And you have parks, such as the, um, the Little Island Park, which is built on 300 floating, or 300 concrete pillars, and the whole island is floating above the harbor. Uh, Little Island Park, it's one hectare in size, it's quite big. We walked along it. It was built uh, by billionaire Barry Diller as is giving back to the city that gave him so much. Barry Diller is a media executive who owns most of the media companies in the world, such as like Fox, MGM, and Paramount. He owns most of all of those movie studios. And he, uh, he decided that as an act of charity, he would give back to the city that he grew up in, New York, and built this little island, he built an artificial island park for the people of the city for $260 million. So uh, that didn't stop him, of course, from also buying himself a private yacht for $200 million. <laughs> so, uh, 
but he's a billionaire, he can afford it. Um, so he, he decided to give some charity by building a park, which is undoubtedly oppressive, this floating park on stilts in the middle of the harbor. And New York has, of course, so many activities to do. There is a costume shop, comedy clubs, jazz clubs, so many things that you can go to. And it's not all concrete. There is lots of restaurants, lots of sporting activities, parks dotted here and there in between the concrete jungle. But of course, it is mostly a concrete jungle. This, wherever you look, towers of either concrete or glass and steel. And everyone jokes that New York is quite dirty also. Although relatively well done, well run in that lots of public transport, you have the subway, you have lots of e-bikes for rent everywhere, uh, efficient transport system, um, not that much traffic, seemingly. And in the subway, you have weird stuff. Ooh, weird stuff going on. It was that loud, that loud yeah. <laughs> Always weird stuff going on in the subway. Um, things, you're like, what? what's that? Uh, let's walk on. <laughs> so overall, New York, definitely an impressive city well-designed and clearly smart people have been intentional about making the city a reasonable place to live, given how much it, given the circumstances. And of course, New York is famous for being restaurants on any corner and everything. Depending on your level of consciousness, you can have anything that you want within New York City. For example, you can have really unhealthy food if you want. <laughs> Uh, anyone know what that stuff is on the left? No. <laughs> no. It's called Dippin' Dots. It's ice cream formed into little balls, somehow. <laughs> and you, you eat it, it kind of melts, supposedly. I didn't have any. <laughs> but uh, uh, it just seems completely unhealthy, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> and of course, the ubiquitous McDonald's burgers and sticky chicken fingers. <laughs> Which, all of which is very unattractive. But then, <laughs> of course, at least to me. Um, then uh, you, you have lots of ham, um, hot dog and cheeseburger stands all over the city, which are apparently quite profitable. You can make like $100,000 running one of those, a year running one of those hot dog stands, apparently. Uh, and farmer's markets for people that do want to buy fresh produce as well as deliveries to your office of smart boxes where you can snack intelligently. And I looked at the ingredients of the intelligent snack and it's just full of sugar. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what <laughs> was intelligent about it, but maybe it's just the marketing. <laughs> but then also, I convinced my work colleagues to at least one day of the time that we were there to go to a vegan restaurant, of which there is, of course, plenty in uh, in New York, and everyone agreed that was the best meal that they had had the whole trip. <laughs> so even one of my work colleagues who prides himself on never eating vegetables in his life, <laughs> he, he, he thought, yeah, that was actually pretty good. If you look at the menu though, everything is like chicken this, what, and uh, beef this, but it's all fake meats, of course. And the waiter said, um, Many people come in here and can't believe that these things we're serving are not actually meat. They, they taste so similar. And he said, I assure you, everything's vegan, definitely. Uh, so if, from my, my own perspective here, this is having these fake meats that convince people that they seem like meat even though they're not isn't particularly attractive. But for, for people that are used to meat and love the taste of meat and can't get over it, it's, but still recognize the problems with eating meat, the health, health problems, the environmental problems, all, and all of those things. Uh, this is a good kind of transition where they can get the taste they want while not killing animals. So that's nice. Um, but from the perspective of the Bhagavad Gita and the Krishna conscious teachings that we teach here at the Loft, Bhagavad Gita explains that the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, but the taste for sense objects remains. So someone that goes, I want to be vegan, 
still has the taste for it. And it's very hard to give that up. But ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste when it's fixed in consciousness. So if you experience a higher taste of something better, you start the Krishna conscious meditation process we, we teach here. Do other, read about the spiritual knowledge that we teach, then that higher, t and of course have the wonderful vegetarian prasadam, spiritualized blessed food that we have here, that we serve here, by having that kind of taste, the lower taste of the fake meats is insignificant. It's like, I don't want that, don't need it. The desire for the meat eating just goes away. All right, moving on, the business city. Some people ask, well, why can't New Zealand produce giant tech companies that rule the world? Well, a one Yiddish concept. Who's heard of this word before? Ah, yes, the Americans. <laughs> um, huspa, if I pronounce it correctly. It's, it used to be an insult to call someone overstepping their boundaries, uh, being ruthless, selling you something with nothing inside. But now it's, it's a badge of honor that's traded around in, in New York especially, where you want to be fierce in your business dealings. You want to go outside what's reasonable for you to do. You want to stand next to the big boys. Sell, 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 sell. Sell, sell it even if you don't have a product. Sell them everything. <laughs> make money and make giant bets. And sometimes they pay off and you can create a gigantic business. Sometimes uh, it fails, but then you do it again <laughs> and try again. Never give up. Failure is not, uh, not a problem. You just keep, keep going. So this huspa advantage that is there in New York business dealings means that everyone is trying to pull a deal on you and everyone is trying to cheat you in various ways. And the only way, I was talking to our CEO, he, he says he hates it, he's Australian, but he, he was saying that he hates it because the only way to get things done is to get really angry with people and challenge them and then they go, and then they give in and you, you can have a reasonable conversation with them <laughs> in business. So, uh, but as a result of that, the businesses that come out, that survive in this uh, snake pit of New York, <laughs> they, they, they are really strong and can compete on the world stage with the, the best products, the best technology. However, as a result of all of this, what happens to people's consciousness? Again, turning to Bhagavad Gita, or chief of the Bharatas, when there is an increase in the mode of passion, symptoms of great attachment, you're incredibly attached to your success, Fruit of activity, you always want the fruits, the result of your activity. Now you grow a tree, you get the fruits. You grow a business, you get the money, you want the money. Intense endeavor, working extremely hard, and uncontrollable desire and hankering develop. So you, your mind goes crazy, always chasing for more and more and more, more and more. And as a result, you have to work really hard and really long. So there's articles written about how in Wall Street bankers, have to work 100 hour weeks and then have a sto still have a social life. How do you do it? How do you work 100 hour weeks and still have a social life? Well, the article explains uh, near the end, well, you can work 100 hour a week and have an active social life if you're willing to sacrifice sleep. Cocaine, obviously, <laughs> helps. <laughs> so yes, uh, so much so. I spoke to one guy in, in New York uh, who wasn't working for our company. He said he went to an interview and uh, the founder of the company he was interviewing with uh, had lines of cocaine on his desk <laughs> while, while he was interviewing her. So. <laughs> so he was like, not the job for me. <laughs> so yes, it's very blatant. Uh, the, uh, the hard work, drug-induced, mode of passion culture in New York. And as a result of all of this going on, again, turning to Bhagavad Gita. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> According to one's association with ma the material qualities of goodness, passion, and ignorance in this life, in one's next life, one receives an appropriate body. So by associating with people around New York who have this extremely passionate attitude, uh, naturally, 
people are transformed. And you stay in New York long enough, you become a New Yorker, and you take on the same attitude, you take on the same qualities, you take on the same body, almost. You reincarnate in this life into a form of someone who is a New Yorker. <laughs> And this is well documented. Nobel Pr uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist has said, live in New York City once, but leave before it makes you hard. Live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you soft. It's well except, oh, by the way, all the pictures you're seeing are pictures I took on my trip from in New York. So they're all, um, all things I took. Okay, next, Ruan City. One of the things in New York, one of the places we visited in New York is the Tesla store, where they were showing off their Tesla robot, not moving, unfortunately, although yesterday they, Tesla demoed them moving and serving drinks and uh, walking and, and everything. And uh, that thing on the left is a self-driving computer, the computer board that controls the, the robots that Tesla builds. And of course, there are shiny cars lined up. And we went on a test drive with, uh, to demonstrate, you might think a robot is, is that, a humanoid thing, but a, a car is also a robot because it's a thing that can move by itself with the AI that Tesla has been developing and we're showing off in the streets of New York. So we went on an autonomous test drive with a Tesla employee explaining how the car went, how the car works, and uh, here's a brief clip. See the person running across the street? See the little people running, adjusting? People, obviously, this, again, this is New York City. You're not going to care about the traffic. It's very, very, very understandable. It's a New York thing. It's a really annoying place. So, right here, this big, massive is. We usually more cars, but this is really annoying. Oh, so, then we'll slowly wait for everyone to cross. And then adjust. And the, um, realign the stuff into the lane. Perfect. And slow down to people crossing, obviously. So yeah, just a brief clip of uh, the self-driving car driving itself around New York. And it's come a huge long way. It's pretty much able to, if, and the Tesla employee said, it, if it can drive in New York, it can drive almost anywhere because um, people do crazy things. <laughs> That's the, the car has to be able to adjust to these circumstances and can pretty much autonomously get you from one place to another. The, uh, following what Tesla is doing with the AI that, and understanding how their machine learning works, I can safely say, give it two or three more years for this to uh, fully to work out all of the edge cases, and so many self-driving cars will be on the road. It will be commonplace to see a car driving with no one inside, or people sleeping in the car while it's going, which means, of course, that everyone whose job is driving a car currently, taxi drivers, Uber drivers, delivery drivers, truck drivers, all will no longer need that job. Would, would, and that's huge portion of the economy, huge, huge number of people unemployed from cars now being able to drive themselves. So for better or for worse, this is coming. Uh, think about this in terms of your own career. If you're, any portion of your job involves driving, definitely it's, uh, it's time for a career change because this is definitely coming. Okay. Carrying on with further robots. Anyone know what this is? Okay, raise your hand if you know what this is. I'm just gauging the consciousness of the room. Oh yeah, okay, quite a few, quite a few. I'm, I'm just wondering how many, how many people are uh, aware of this, and uh, maybe like 20, 30% of, of the room, more than I expected. <laughs> it depends, I'm so involved in this technology world, I, I sometimes I'm out of touch with regular people. <laughs> <laughs> So interesting for me to see. 
uh, Cybertruck made of stainless steel. Uh, the, um, the Tesla employee was quite, was quite um, enthusiastic when he, when he saw this parked outside. Mm -hmm. he, he was like, oh yeah, we have one of those, but that's the beast. That's a cyber beast. It weighs three tons and can go zero to 100 in two and a half seconds. <laughs> which is amazing for this tank <laughs> to be able to accelerate fast in a sports car. So, and drive itself, of course, also. So, uh, yes, impressive technology, for sure, result of the HUSPA in America. And New York is very, very expensive. Uh, imagine uh, a small hotel room with a view of the Empire State Building. How much do you think it costs to stay? Anyone? 1000 hmm? $1, yes, pretty close. Correct. $1,200 a night. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's very expensive to stay in Manhattan in New York. Of course, if you, the further out you go, the cheaper it gets. Um, also, home of New York is the world's best restaurant. 11 Madison Park, widely regarded as the best restaurant in the entire world. Um, there's like a six month waiting list to have a meal <laughs> at the restaurant. And from a review of the restaurant, almost $2,000 for a dinner for two. Well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous experience, excellent food. Service beyond compare. <laughs> what do you think? $2,000 is a well worth it for, <laughs> for a dinner for two? Well, expensive. You have to be rich to, to live in New York, uh, a city for the rich. Also, uh, after COVID, of course, all restaurants were shut down. And the founder of 11 Madison Park, Daniel Hum, who was originally from Switzerland, he, he decided he would turn the restaurant vegan. Uh, and he was thinking, so every, rest, every kind of top tier restaurant in the world serves so much meat. And it's usually wasteful, really bad for people's health, bad for the environment. Also, from our understanding, bad for the karma of the people eating, bad for the karma of the people cooking. And so many, so many bad things come from the restaurant industry. But it's self-reinforcing, where people see all these successful restaurants and they're all serving so much meat. So to be a successful restaurant, all other restaurants think, hey, we need to serve meat too, otherwise we can't be successful. And so he decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my restaurant fully vegan, as an example, to others, to show it can be done. You can be a super successful restaurant and be vegan. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And initially, so many reviewers were like, he's terrible. He's destroying his business. What's he thinking? It's, it's horrible. But then people actually went and were like, this is actually quite amazing <laughs> experience. And I don't, I don't understand what they've done with the, uh, how they've managed to construct these super elaborate meals, 10 course meals, and make them all vegan. And after a year or so of the restaurant reopening, he was back in business and reviews were glowing and he was getting even more success than he had before in his, in his restaurant. And Bhagavad Gita explains, he's quite right, that whatever action a great person performs, common people follow. And what are sta whatever standards they set by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. So yes, he was quite right in his understanding that if he sets this example, others within the city and within the world will follow that example. But someone has to take the first step. So he did, and indeed there, there are so many vegan restaurants all over New York now who are, who are seeing the success of 11 Madison and going, well, if he can do it, we can do it too. All right, moving on. The High Line in New York. Back. Uh, back a hundred years ago, New York had a problem. Pictures from the city a hundred years ago. There were street trains and heavy traffic of goods coming in and out of New York, particularly in this one district, uh, which was the meatpacking district of New York. They had a problem that people kept dying. Yes, in the, in the meatpacking also, but also on the street. 500 people died, either run over by the train or run over by the traffic, and 1,500 people were injured. There's continuous injuries and death from 
the traffic. So what, what can they do? What, what, what could the problem be? Of course, we understand that all the animals are awaiting your death so that they can avenge the injuries you have inflicted upon them. Srinath Bhagavatam explains, all the animals that were killed in the, in the meatpacking, they are waiting to extract their revenge where the person who has either killed the animals, eaten the animals, transported the animals, all the people involved in the chain of animal slaughter, they reincarnate as one of those animals in the future and get killed by the animal now reincarnated as the, the meat eater. So, <laughs> the revenge is, and, and this is part of the reason why there is so much, uh, so much death surrounding, uh, surrounding the meat industry, both from the people eating it, be, getting unhealthy, from the people transporting it, getting run over by the trains, and so many things. So what, so what did they do in 1910? Well, they decided we're going to use our ingenuity, we're going to elevate the road, we're going to build a high line an elevated railroad that will transport all the goods back and forth. Um, and it cost you a bunch of money. And we can, we can remove what was called, as it was known, Death Alley. <laughs> the, the street was known. And we can remove Death Alley and make it elevated and it'll be safe. But soon after, it became too expensive to run meatpacking inside New York City. And it moved elsewhere. And the, the High Line was a waste where it was just empty. Uh, the trains were no longer running. And recently, 10 years ago, uh, a foundation decided to turn it into a beautiful park, which 8 million people a year walk along. It's, it's very nice. Uh, it's beautifully landscaped. You can walk along these large cities, uh, large apartment buildings, and uh, nice nature retreat in the middle of the concrete jungle of New York. Inclu including Barry Diller also donated, the executive, uh, media executive I told about earlier who built Little Island. He also donated to the High Line to make that happen. All right, Me City. Along the High Line, there was a very appropriate sign. This. <laughs> Which, quite appropriate in, in terms of uh, America is all about me. So much so, uh, when we, I walked past a gym, and I just had to take a picture of the sign advertising the gym outside, it was like, intensity, want it all. Indulgence, want it all. Equinox gym, it's not fitness, it's life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> life is intensity. Oh, so that's person's muscle, and then on the right it's like a mouth sideways, Eating, eating some berries or something. <laughs> so, all, with all of this passion, you expect in America there's lots of obesity, not so much in New York. Everyone's so driven, so many people running, so many people exercising all the time. Uh, not much problem with obesity, but problem with this mode of passion, consciousness. And then you think, oh, well, what's wrong with being really intense and indulging in your senses and getting all the satisfaction, getting all the happiness, right? You get all the happiness from indulging in it. Well, Bhagavad Gita explains. An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with ma the material senses. Or son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and so the wise person does not delight in them. Bhagavad Gita explains the the intensity, it has a beginning and end. Taking the cocaine, it's not good for you. It has an end. It might feel good in the moment, but think about a few, more mom a few moments later. So a wise, wise person goes, I recognize not just the immediate pleasure, I recognize the long-term pleasure, the long-term happiness from this, and I will not indulge in these kind of pleasure, these kind of things which are actually sources of misery. Im immediate sources of seemingly happiness, but down the line sources of misery. So therefore, the wise person goes, I'm not going to sign up for something that's going to be miserable in the end. I, I want something better. Uh, the team of Bhagavatam, which takes the themes of Bhagavad Gita and elaborates on them, explains this a little bit further in the conversation where Father is saying, my dear sons, 
there's no reason to labor very hard for the sense pleasures while in this human form of life. Such pleasures are available to the stool eaters, the hogs. Rather, you should undergo tapa, austerity, in this life, by which your existence will be purified, and as a result, you will be able to enjoy eternal blissful life, which is transcendental to material happiness. Eternal blissful life can transcend, go beyond, be above material happiness. It's something that is entirely on a different platform to material happiness, not involved in the same laws of action and reaction, cause and effect. This eternal blissful happiness that we hope to achieve here, the loft, that kind of happiness is, uh, is not tied to any material condition. It's like, you're just happy because there's no reason. There's no, I'm, I'm happy if I get the intensity. I happy, I'm happy if I get the indulgence. I'm happy if I take the cocaine. <laughs> no. Uh, happiness, you're just happy. No material cause. So, let's talk about the illusion city. Illusion, maya is a Sanskrit word for illusion. So, we visited, quite appropriately, the New York Museum of Illusions. <laughs> nice old building. And in this Museum of Illusions, there's, you can see so many things that uh, appear to be something other than they, what they are. For example, um, this is a pyramid triangle, right? And you look at it and... Uh, <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it's a mirror. <laughs> a mirror along the, the middle. Um, so you th it tricks you. You're thinking, ah, oh, it seems so good from, it seems like it, the pyramid that I'm, I'm look, looking after. No, no, it's a square. How did it turn into a square? I don't know. Uh, or like this. Um, are these the same length? Yes? No? Yes? You're like, what? <laughs> Huh? Even if you know it's an illusion, it kind of tricks you. <laughs> the thinking, huh? What's happening? <laughs> so this is the this is the nature of Maya. This is the nature of illusion. That which is not. Seems like it's a painting on the wall, showing you perspective. But you go up to it, and it, it's actually a thing sticking out. And you go away, and it looks like it's going in again. You can touch the thing in the middle. <laughs> it's completely bewildering. <laughs> you think? It's one thing, but it's another? So it's like that, this, this illusion of material success. You think, if only I get it, then I'll be happy. But then you're not happy, and you're like, what happened? It's like, it's like this illusion. You grab it, and it's like, no, what, what? It doesn't make, a, it doesn't make sense. Even if, you know, it, even if you know the trick, it still tricks you. You can't help it. Again, Bhagavad Gita enlightens us, explains. Under illusion. You are now declining to act according to my direction. So Krishna is speaking to Arjuna here. Under illusion, you're not doing the right thing that you, your, your teacher is instructing you to do. But compelled by work born of your own nature, you will act all the same, O son of Kunti. So you will work. Even if you think you understand the illusion and you think, I'm going to do what I want, I know what I'm doing, you can't help but act according to your nature. You can't help but act according to your surroundings, your association, the people around you. You, know, you live in New York and you turn into New Yorker. You can't help but act as a New Yorker. Even if you see the, the illusion of it all, people can't help. You get absorbed in all of that. And uh, you might think, I understand the illusion. I resist. But no. The city eats you and swallows you and spits you out. And you end up acting just the same as everyone else, under illusion, that is. But 
if there is a positive alternative, well, that would be an improvement. <laughs> so, conclusion. New York is uh, an amazing city, impressive, oh, full of business, full of technology, full of opportunity. There's so much to do, to do at the same time, it's so, <coughs> so full of illusion <laughs> and so distracting from the real meaning of life. Impressive place to visit, for sure, but I certainly am not spiritually strong enough to survive in a city like that. I prefer Auckland, <laughs> that's why I'm staying here, even though, of course, I could move to America if I wanted to. Prefer the slightly lesser illusion of Auckland. <laughs> However, in the midst of the illusion of New York, there, there was a place which unfortunately, because I was so wrapped up in so many work meetings and uh, having to socialize with all my work colleagues, I did not have a, the opportunity to visit this place, but very much next time, there is a Krishna conscious oasis, even, or several actually, even in New York City. Let's do a, a brief visit to that place, uh, called the Bhakti Center. <laughs> in pretty much every city in the world, Krishna consciousness is available for those who are seeking. Ah, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>